So I assume some of you are going to, most of you will be here tonight when I'm talking. Um, so you probably want me to talk about things I'm not talking about tonight. Is that right? I mean, I don't know what you want me to do. There could be overlap. There could be a little bit of overlap. I mean, so I was thinking, well, I don't want to. And I actually haven't figured out fully what I'm going to say, quite frankly. <laughs> you know, which is generally how it goes. I was like, uh, you know, I got the general idea and then I got to putz around and deliberate. But fortunately, I think I'm the last speaker, so I have a little more time, which is good for me. Um, I've been at this for about 30 years. I think y'all know that. I uh, mostly spend, you know, and I work, I'm from the White Earth Reservation, which is in northern Minnesota, and I'm Anishinaabe or Ojibwe. I have spent most of my time fighting, uh, I spent a lot of years fighting bad mining projects. Um, uranium mines, coal strip mines, um, yeah. And then I um, ended up in Canada. I lived in Moose Factory for six years. I was married to a chief who recently passed, um, Randy Kapashisit from Moose Factory. And uh, I ended up fighting dam projects, uh, James Bay II. And in each case, you know, I'll probably talk about this some tonight, you have a situation where uh, we, we defeat a project um, but you don't reduce the demand. And so they just move to another bad idea. And the indigenous communities, by and large, that are implicated or the prey, you know, end up in a situation where they are, they are still as, as uh, um, at risk of, you know, they don't, they don't have control over their economy. Um, they don't have control over a lot, frankly. So I'm a rural development economist. That's my training. I thought about being a lawyer, but I realized I'd spend all my time getting my cousins out of jail for stupid stuff. And so I'm not a um, I'm, I'm a writer, obviously, and a journalist. I've been at that for quite a long time. But my interest is largely in the questions, the larger economic questions and the questions of rural economies. How you gain control and how you keep them. Um, and how you look at the same equation over and over you know, of a mining company comes in with this number of jobs and they talk about this as, or this, you know, bad idea, you know, essentially, you know, one idea after another. And, and, and the economic analysis that is, you know, I mean, I always say, which I think you guys are probably pretty hip to, is like, just if you keep repeating the lie, it doesn't mean it's true. So if you say, you know, this is good for the economy, you know, someone needs to deconstruct that argument. And I'm sure Naomi Klein's gonna do a fine job of that tonight. You know, but at the same time, you know, I look at it in these communities and that's what you're looking at. If someone is saying, you know, this is how many jobs. And so, and this is, you know, the, what works in this, um, you know, system. And very few people, um, not enough people, we'll say, there's not enough deconstructing de their analysis. Because their analysis is faulty. It's based on things like endless access to water. You know, which it turns out that, you know, it's finite. There's not more water. You know, and uh, what we have isn't theirs. Um, or, you know, endless, or, or it's predicated on an overconsumptive, inefficient economy. Um, largely, you know, an energy economy would be a perfect example. The U.S. Um, wastes about 57% of its energy between point of origin and point of consumption. Um, probably don't want to try to reboot that economy. They always say renewables won't work, won't meet the present demand. I'm like, why the hell would you want to? You know, it's so inefficient. It's so inefficient. And then, you know, tribal communities, indigenous communities, you know, are, um, end up having very little control of their economies. And, you know, on, a, on, on this smaller scale, they're looking at, you know, these same things. The, the DIA, Indian Affairs, or, or the BIA, whoever is coming in and saying, you got jobs. Look at this, full-time employment opportunity with this, you know, new operation. And instead, there's no analysis of, of one, what they're losing. Right with it, with their traditional economy or the wealth of it, um, there's no self-reliance or, or analysis of how you get out of, you know, the cycle. Um, in the case, and you know, I'll talk about this some tonight. But what I do on my own reservation, and and you know, I'm I'm working on kind of more broadly in Indian country is this question of, if you do an analysis of a local economy, on our reservation we analyzed food and energy systems. We found that we we spend a quarter of our money on food and a quarter of our money on energy. And in both cases, in the case of food, we spend $8 million a year. And of that, $7 million is spent off reservation like that, at Walmart, Food Service of America, trucked in food from California or wherever, right? Totally inefficient um, 
you know, relationship to the broader industrialized food system, which you know causes global climate destabilization, and consumes too much fossil fuels, right? And um, so you, but and, and similarly with energy, we spend a quarter of our money on energy, and in both cases, it's all drained out of a community. The economic drain represents almost 50% of your economy. Any wealth you bring in, full-time employment or special jobs, it's gone. You know, and so instead of tackling the leak, they just want to bring in more jobs. No one wants to say, how about we quit leaking? You know, which is the answer, is quit leaking, because then you have some control. You know, you have control over your food economy, you have control over your energy economy, and you have basically, you know, meaningful self-determination, self-reliance. That's an essential, you know, part of the strategy. Then you add health and, and you know, and for housing in there, which is easily added in. I mean, I'm just saying that the, that the theoretical construct is what I largely work on, and, and that is applicable to pretty much any economy. It's not just, you know, tribal or indigenous communities. So that's what I work on. I been at it for a long time, I, and, and I still fight mining companies. You know, communities call me up and say, would you come out here and, you know, and I'll, go, I'll go there. I just came back from a community in northern Michigan that's looking at their entire land bases leased by Rio Tinto Zinc. You know, and so I'm, I'm uh, working to try to figure out what we can do. But you had a question? Yeah, um, just to build off of your uh, comments <coughs> on how you work on the theories of it, uh, do you have any um, cases in mind where that theory has come into practice and it's been a real catalyst for hope in any reserve or community? That's my community. Yeah. That's my work. I live in a community and I work there. And then I, you know, broadly discuss this. But my reservation is in the process of relocalizing our food and energy economies. Um, we, you know, there's the first you start with in energy. And this is not rocket science. Some of you, as you start with your efficiency issue, you know, the fact of how much you lose in your winter heating system. You put solar thermal on the south side of your walls, right? You understand what I'm saying, right? And then, you, you know, geothermal puts a new house. You can put that in there, and then you look at your electricity. In my case, I live in a reserve. A reservation that has class four, which is you know utility scale wind potential, Northern Plains reservation. So that's what I'm looking. I got one turbine. I you know it's a 75 kilowatt. I'm scaling to a 39 and a half because the law. And one Kilos 750. Per, uh, per day that's the size. Per... I don't know what they call that. I mean it's just like the production. So it's so it yeah. produces enough for a school. <coughs> okay. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Yeah. Basically, for a school, a size for a school. I'm, I'm really interested in community wind. Yeah. I'm not interested in. I'm interested in utility scale because you got to deal with climate change. You got to scale up. But I'm really interested in communities being able to own and control the technology. Yeah. yeah. Self reliance and in a meaningful way, you know. And so I just, for instance, this summer I hauled my sorry butt over to the community wind energy conference in Bonn, Germany, because all the intellectual capital is over there. Yeah. I mean, it's not here. You know, I mean, there were some interesting people from Ontario at it, actually, who are looking at the same thing. But uh, and um, uh, there's one reserve on Manitoulin Island that just put up a two kilowatt, no, two two megawatt, I think, one point two megawatt or two megawatt of wind. Um, but you know, that's that would be a really useful transfer of intellectual capital, is what Denmark has and what Germany has, because it makes a lot of sense for our communities at scale, so that you can fix it. You know, you don't need to import. I mean, the, the community, my favorite community is this community called Lowland that I haven't got myself over to yet. Lowland is in um, Denmark. It's an island, remote. The reason it's important in analysis is, is that like Canadian communities are remote too, right? Reservations are remote communities. We're not talking about places that are always grid tied and are, have also been marginalized from the broader economic wealth. If you understand what I'm saying, an island in Denmark, right? And so they were going downhill, and they decided that they would use their intellectual capital to build wind turbines. And I, almost every wind turbine that's on the market today came out of Denmark. And they have, you know, very good wind, and in this island alone, they produce three times more power than they can use. And um, it's all wind, pretty much. So I'm interested in this scale. And, um, you know, I'm interested in continuing, I, I believe, you know, and it's, I think what I'll tell people today probably is what I usually say is you got to keep fighting these guys, you know, because you got to fight these guys just, you know, over and over and over, but at the same time, you better have a better plan. 
they're just letting me have a better plan and actualize it, you know, uh, because, and, and we have to articulate our plan and say, this is what it looks like. This is what the future looks like without them. And, you know, don't be afraid because people are motivated by fear. You know, a lot of Canadians are certainly a fearful bunch generally. You know, we're afraid of being cold and it's going to be dark and be, you know, won't have our whatever. You know, I don't mean to ridicule y'all, but, you know, it's, 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 it's a learned behavior. And, and we also, the other thing that we did really successfully that you all know is that we all um, relinquished power to experts. So experts take care of energy. You know, we really don't know anything about that. You know, and who's going to solve, solve, serve, you know, solve the world's food problems? Well, let's just let Monsanto do that one, because they really know what they're doing. You know, that's where we got to. We got to be people who are consumers. You know, we're all a bunch of consumers, and we believe that we don't know how to handle that stuff. And thank God we have those experts and that the set of the medical establishment, our other great experts, right? You know, and so in that whole process, look where we got. Fabulous. You know, we're dependent and sick, <laughs> largely. So, you know, I, I, you know, you guys are a, a, a very educated bunch, but, you know, I mean, by and large, I mean, you know, I've got a, I've got a liberalized education, too. I mean, and by the time you're done with your liberalized education, you're, you can discuss a lot of things, but you really can't do shit, you know? You don't know much about wind turbines, you don't know how to fix a car, and you don't know how to grow your own damn food. I mean, not to belabor, but the point is, is that we're critical thinkers, but you actually got to be able to do something. And, uh, you know, anyway, wow. When you, try, when you try to implement these self-reliance strategies within communities, what's mm -hmm. the main point of resistance? Um, you know, the communities I work generally, the first, you know, it's interesting because I was talking to these youth and you saw is, is this belief that you can't do it because they didn't tell you you could do it. Like, I work in communities that have been told that, you know, uh, we are not smart. And they are right, and they are going to win anyway. And... Um, you know, they have a better plan, really. And we don't want to be those Indians that we used to be. Literally. You know, and so what you got to do, in my strategy of organizing, people say, what's your strategy? It's like, we call it organizing by example. You just go do it. You do it, and then they say, well, how'd you do that? I'm like, well, you know. And then the next thing you know, like my tribal government, so I live on a big reserve. It's kind of like a Six Nations Reserve. So there's 300, well, it's 867,000 acres of land, right? And in that we have, um, most of the land is not owned by our tribe, but we have quite a bit. We have 25,000 tribal members. My tribal government is not particularly progressive. And, and I'm, you know, as you've just hung out with me, you can imagine that I'm like, you know, the crazy woman to the council half the time. Like, oh my gosh, here she comes. You know, but then I laugh because they say, first they say, you know, we used to think you're crazy, and now we see you're right. But the tribal chair wouldn't say that. You know, she's very competitive with me, which is the most stupid thing I ever heard. But, you know, then we put up the wind turbine and then they have to put up a bigger one. I'm like, there you go. <laughs> Use all that dysfunctional stuff and just make it bigger, you know? And then we started growing our foods out. I grow really cool corn varieties out and, uh, you know, other local foods. And now they want to do a farm to cafeteria program for their elders and their tribal programs. And we're the only people growing. You know, so they're like, okay. You know, so it, it takes, so what I'm saying is, is that sometimes you got to start and just do it and keep at it and they'll make fun of you. It's like, the, you know, Gandhi used to say, it's like they laugh at you, they fight you, whatever, and then, you know, pretty much you win. And so, you know, I find that that's a very good strategy. And then the other thing is, is that, I mean, you guys are, you know, private organizers and, and I don't know what I'm going to tell people tonight, but the other thing is, it's like, you know, I don't say keep your word, you know, do your best to keep your word, you know. I, I work really hard. I've raised uh, six kids. You know, they're all mine. And I just got another, you know, so I got six now. I was like, I guess that's what the creator wanted me to have. And I, you know, live in my community. People see me. You know, I go travel around, whatever. But people, you know, and then I went on Facebook, which was a great and very interesting thing about four months ago, because people, like, you know, ask me things. And, you know, I feel like I'm... But what am I trying to say in this is that, is that if you've got the public trust, try to keep your word. You know what I'm saying? Is that, is that we need to be people that, that, you know, don't give up. Be those people, don't give up. You know, someone has to be those people and then more people are inspired to be those people. You know, if they see that. And, and, uh, and you know, keep at it and be, you know, be smart and be funny. I mean, you know, because we're way cooler than they are anyway. You know, so, yeah. yeah. No, I completely agree. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is that, you know, when you create a ripple, 
when you drop a rock in a pond, you create a ripple, and it inspires other people to drop their rocks in the pond and create other ripples, and soon you're creating a wave, right? So, uh, very, very true words, what you're saying. Uh, so just coming, I did a law degree, unfortunately. <laughs> so it's okay, you, you you're okay. You made a choice uh, not to, so I did a law degree at UBC, and you know, there's, some, there's so many great stories that I do have a chance to hear um, through my work at the Davis Suzuki Foundation or through environmental law about um, this perception of Aboriginal communities and what they're like and hearing more and more stories of all the good work and all the social innovation, if you want to call it, that is happening. Um, how can we start to showcase more of those? Because I think there's innovation. There's always been a rich tradition and history and knowledge within your culture, but how can we support you to showcase that as well? well because yeah. I think social media is key for that. Well, social media and also the legal profession is really important. So for instance, you know, the, the vast majority of legal work in the, in the indigenous communities, or Aboriginal communities, First Nations communities, is largely defending our communities against bad, bad shit, right? Yeah. Let's just be honest, that's where we're at, right? You know, which absolutely is essential. The other side of it, though, is that, you know, we are communities that, um, we need to exercise our sovereignty. So for instance, my tribe, I want them to enact a tribal food code, right? They're looking at one, one that was written by me, the state of Maine, which has a pretty progressive food code. They have like a lot of organic farms and stuff. And I'm like, yeah, that's good, but it doesn't have the same origin. You know, our food came, uh, you know, not from organic farm, our food came from the bush. And then the corn was given to us by, you know, a long time ago, when we grew all these corn varieties out. And so, you know, our code has to reflect who we are. And then from that's where it comes from. And then you have the more specific you know, elements of, for instance, why your seeds should not be genetically engineered. You know, if these are, if it's a part of your ethno, or you know, your, your uh, you know, if it's part of your history, you know, your seeds are cosmogenealogy is like some, you know, some, as you probably know, like some people like descended with corn. You know what I'm saying? This is it. So it's not just like, we don't like GMOs. It's like, it violates our sacredness, right? And that has to be part of these codes. Um, you know, so that's what I look at a lot, is how you build and codify systems so that tribal sovereignty means something. You know, and my, my theory on this is, is that you use it or you lose it. You know, and we need to exercise, we need tribal food codes now. And then an interesting case, oh, I gave those youth, oh, they took my cool posters, but anyway, I'll have some more <laughs> posters tonight. We're looking at this issue of the wolf. In northern Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan, um, the wolf is, is a, a, the largest wolf range in our, you know, it's one of the, the, the wolf has just been delisted off the endangered species list, right, uh, in the United States. And it was contemporaneous with the push for new mines. You know, so you knock the wolf out and you don't have an endangered species in your, in your mining zone, essentially as part of what happened, right? I mean, you know, and I'm sure that it was related. Um, you know, it's kind of like, you know, whatever. But, um, our tribes, um, our tribe, you know, after some deliberation, you know, which I shouldn't even mention, but you know, it's like some stupidity for a moment, and then someone smacked them upside the head, said, don't delist. And in fact, we create a wolf sanctuary. And so now the majority of the Ojibwe tribes in our region are not delisting. And, and so then that provides, you know, so you, we don't have an endangered species code for our tribes, you know, but we need that. You know what I'm saying? And then we need to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the feds and say, you know what, uh, you're going to delist, but our treaty rights said we don't have to, you know, we, we keep it like this, so, you know, you know, so, um, but the season is starting this, uh, starting next week, I think, in some of those places. It's going to be interesting. But my tribe said, you hunt on my res our reservation, we cite you, we seize your wolf, we seize your gun. You know, because non-Indians can come into our territory. And we're saying that's not going to happen up here. And you know, interestingly enough, when I drove here, I mean, I've been deliberating on these things, but this is how I am and how I believe, because we have a lot of ceremonies in this, but when I came here, I saw a wolf on the way. And they are very sparse. I haven't seen wolf, I saw wolf one time about three years ago, no, five, six years ago, and I saw wolf last week, and I saw wolf this morning, wow. at 4 a.m., driving, you know, he just crossed the road in front of me, and I saw one playing in a field on Monday, Tuesday, right after I went left to that mining meeting. In that community, smack dab looking at Rio Tinto Zinc all around them. Big mining operation they want to start, Keywood Bay, and every other 640 acre parcel, the mining mineral rights are held by Rio Tinto Zinc. 
And you know, that community asked me to go up and talk to them, and I said, you know, one of the things you gotta do is not delist the wolf. They said, we just did that. I said, and then, you know, but, so what I'm saying is, is that using, you know, restoring and strengthening tribal legal systems, yeah. important strategy. And just as a follow-up to that, because, uh, you know, I, was, I am and have been passionate about environmental law, but also have studied enough Aboriginal law to know that that is a fine, uh, kind of unclear border between traditional rights and traditional uh, ways and laws and the colonial laws and that rule are day. And so how do, how do you, in addition to pushing back, but is there, how do you find working with, within the context of the existing colonial legal system? I, you know, I try to avoid it at all costs, <laughs> you know? I mean, I, you know, I like to theor theoretically say that the, that the law is just, but I, you know, I have a limited experience with that. Yeah. And so my counsel is usually to, you know, I mean, although in the states, you know, our extraterritorial treaty rights outside of our, treaty, our, our reservations were all upheld. You know, it cost the state of Minnesota $18 million and they lost to the Supreme Court. So I'm like, you don't got the money to do that one again, do you? Yeah, exactly. You know what I'm saying? So, so you know, I, we, we can prevail, but I think it's way too risky. And I'd rather win, you know, on a lot of, I mean, I, you know, the way you beat mining projects is when they, when they say it's become, it's, you know, uneconomical to mine. And that's, you know, because you pounded them in court, you pounded them in public opinion, you pounded them in the media, and you pounded them with your tribe, and you pounded them, you know, you know, and you prayed, and you did everything. That's when they say, they don't ever say you were right. They all just say, you know, they never say they're sorry. You know, Chevron can't say it's sorry for Equinor, right? Right? Yeah. It was that nine billion dollars worth of? I'm sorry, I can't do that one, right? Yeah. You know, you guys know we're talking about them. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, have there have been any <coughs> positive examples of private companies coming in, and, for example, uh, doing renewable energy projects or the like? I'm working on it. I mean, right now I'm trying to I'm trying to get the intellectual capital to run my own. I don't know because I've been at this. You know, I'm 53. You know, and I just went through about five years of the most expensive wind energy education you can imagine. I mean, I worked on this project, you know, it was insane. The engineering is insane. I, you know, it's just crazy. And I was like, I'm done. You know, and I'm not an engineer. We already discussed this. But I want, I want, you know, some projects that work, and then I'm going to scale. And, I, you know, I'm going to find somebody to partner with who's probably a corporation and developer. And I don't know who that is. I, I, well, I can give you a suggestion after the meeting. Yeah. You know, but that's what that's what I want to do is probably find a developer and scale my product because my my tribe could produce wind, you know, quite a bit of wind, and then once we develop, but this is this is the same theory, you know, which is someone has to do it, and after someone sticks their neck out, you know, and I'm on the verge, my project will be up by February, you know, this first one, and then I'm, I already, you know, I'm gonna go bigger, you know, and I already have a you guys, you know, can you can look look us up on the web, although we're just recreating our website and our radio station Niji Radio, but Writers Land Recovery Project and Honor the Earth. But um, we got it, you know, we got it going on. It's not scaled, but it will scale. And I just got back from uh, India, pretty interesting. I went and saw Vandana Shiva, and I saw her. You guys all know who she is? The cool, the cool chick. I, want, I used to want to grow up and be like her. Someplace between her and Cher. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like, it's like looking at me. It's that horrible idea. But you know what I'm saying? Like, why not so rocks and Cher like 32 outfits in one show? Come on! <laughs> <laughs> you don't look like Cher, actually. Uh, I don't look like Cher, but anyway, it's just yeah, funny. Yeah, yeah. Alright, whatever. But anyway, y'all been embarrassed. You gotta get all right. It's <laughs> really like, you can't believe she said that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like, that's right. So that's true. That's embarrassing. Anyway. <laughs> her because I was like, you know, because I know her for all these years, and we, we fought the genetic engineering of wild rice in my community, in our, our tribe, and we, we successfully, there's no genetically engineered wild rice, and they ain't coming back, but, you know, of course I had to fight Monsanto. You know, this is my battle from 2000 to 2007, right? We're good. But first person I went to ask was Vandana. I was like, how you do this, you know? And so she gave me some legal counsel, and I was like, oh, we're good. I got it, girl. And so then I just went over there, but it was very interesting because to see their scale, very similar to ours, her uh, Namdanya, her research facility is very similar to my facility, and I was like, okay, I got it. You know, it's interesting because you're out there, I don't know how to describe this to you, but you know, since I'm not talking to everybody, I'm just talking to you guys, you know, there's not a road map, you know, and there's not one of those Garmin or GPSs that's going to figure this out. 
You know, honestly, honestly. You gotta, I mean, I, I pray hard. I, you know, I don't tell people how to pray, but I'm like, I, I say half the time I need divine intervention, and I need to have, be really smart. You gotta talk to the right people. You gotta deliberate. You gotta like, look at things, and then you gotta also look at opportunities and seize the time. You know what I'm saying? Is that there is no exact way this is, works. You know what I'm saying? But, but somehow you gotta move where you're going. And our communities count on us to do that. You know, and, and, and um, you know, try not to, I mean, you're gonna make some mistakes. You learn and learn from your mistakes. Like I said, I worked on these wind projects and I had, you know, so many smart white guys, excuse me, that just like basically, at the end of it, I was like, and, and none of them could make my projects work. And they cost me a lot of money and I was like, that's it, I'm done, I'm done. You know, I'm gonna figure out how to do this and you know, I'm not gonna do everything, but I'm not gonna give project management over to anybody this time, you know. But if I can't explain to a community how to do this, then, you know, it's not going to work out. Yeah? Um, how do you negotiate, because you operate at a pretty high academic level a lot of the time, how do you negotiate that academic knowledge and mindset with working with communities who, as you mentioned earlier, are told over and over that they don't know how to do something? I can, you know, I'm perfectly capable. Of, I mean, my community knows, uh, they count on me to, <laughs> to articulate at a conference, or they count on me to articulate, you know, when we're fighting someone. But, you know, my, my, you know, what I, how I became the organizer I am, or whatever the heck I am, is because I had to take really complicated things, like Pico Curies and radiation levels of exposure, and explain it to people. Or explaining genetically, <laughs> genetic engineering, genetic modification to traditional people, you know, so you got to take it and make it so it's simple, and then they say, wow, what the heck's that, you know? Which is the right answer. But, you know, um, you, so I, you know, everybody in my community can talk to me, you know, and they also, I mean, that's what, you know. And then on the other side of it, what is hilarious, I mean, so I, I feel okay. You know, I could go anywhere in my community and they all know me, like, hey, sister, or whatever. Then I, I, I like my, my ink here. They're always like, you know, because a lot of Native people have prison tattoos. They're like, I got this Stillwater 2000, or you know, you know, they're always showing me their ink, and I'm like, yeah, you know, like it. Mm -hmm. So I got a little bit more leverage with my new ink, you know, a couple years ago. They're like, yeah, you're cool, auntie. They all call me auntie. Um, but um, the other thing is, is that you know, frankly, you know, I don't know if you know much about my education, Harvard, MIT, you know, Antioch. You know, I, I'm I'm okay. You know, got a few books down. I'm good. But I go to a hearing and testify. And when the Wild Rice hearing, I had to bring three white guys with me, you know, with PhDs to explain things because, you know, after all, I was the cultural perspective, you know. And, and the same thing, I was at this hearing on carbon in, in uh, New Mexico, and I was, you know, it was my birthday. I never do things like that on my birthday, but it was like my birthday present to everybody else was like, you know, so sitting on my birthday, I'm sitting there being cross-examined by all these utilities and energy companies for like six hours. Right? I was like, wait to spend your birthday, huh? You know, and they were just, you know, they were first they were picking at my footnotes in my testimony. I was like, oh, which, you know, endless. And then finally I said, you know, they're like, are you sure this is the page? I said, I did not have that with me. I said, and then finally I said to them, I said, halfway through the commissioners were laughing, I said, are you guys gonna ask me anything substantive? Or are we just gonna stick to footnotes? You know, because they, they didn't know how to question. And then they, finally the guy says to me, he says, Ms. LaDuke, so he's got this look on his face. He says, "You, this is kind of a tribal opinion, isn't it?" So he says to me, "I so I suppose them degrees from Harvard, MIT, and all that really ain't worth shit in here." I didn't say, "We're not we're, worth anything, huh?" You know. And then they all kind of chuckled, you know, because I was like, "What the hell?" Yeah. You know, because you're a native woman. The assumption is is that you're not as smart as them. You know. Accessibly yeah. reductive. Huh? It's reductive. Yeah, it's totally, and it's, you know, so they just try to diminish my, I mean, they, they actually spent most of the time trying to get me thrown out as an expert witness, but they didn't succeed, you know, I mean, because I'm, you know, I'm qualified to testify, but, you know, and then that was the other thing I really liked was he, at one point he says, so who said that? And I said, I said that. <laughs> and they said, and he like looks at me and I said, I'm the expert witness, and I quoted myself because I could say that because I'm the expert. <laughs> you know? He was like, look, like you had to have some citation. You know, they don't, you know, you don't become an expert witness by only, you know, you deduce things yourself. That's how you become the expert. You know, I was like, so. But anyway, I'm just telling you that because that's being a native person in this millennium. You know, it could be anyone. It's also quite often with women. 
you know, we're totally like, you know, marginalized and not considered to be legitimate authorities. So yeah, I'm used to it. But you know, my community's good. I'm good. I hang out and I chill. I got you know, I'm pretty resy. You know, I'm <laughs> just as resy as anybody else. If you know you want to hear my story. I'm good. What's next on your uh, on your plan for community development or That'd be enough. That'd probably keep me going on this wind projects and my food system. I'm gonna talk a little bit about my food system work yeah. tonight, but I'm restoring these really old varieties of corn that are, I call them climate change resistant. <laughs> yeah, they are uh, grow about this tall, they're big ears on them, they're drought resistant, frost resistant, and wind resistant. And probably, and they, we pushed corn 100 miles north of Winnipeg, the Ojibwe's, and so that's the varieties I'm growing is northern Manitoba flint, because I think that if you want to eat in 20 years, you better be growing something that you can you know, take care of. No. That's similar to what Vandana does, though. Because she grows 600 varieties of rice, including the saline, saline uh, resistant. And so when they had the tsunami in Sri Lanka, their rice varieties they sent over there because the, the land was salty. And, and these, these farmer varieties, they had specialized in not Monsanto varieties, but these farmer varieties could, could live. You know, and that's what's so, it's brilliant. So, you know, it's a similar strategy. She fights Monsanto and grows her seeds. And so, you know, that's, that's our strategy, essentially. It was very interesting, I mean, because you guys are hanging out with me, but, like, you need to figure out, you need your political peers. And obviously, she's 10 years older and a lot larger. But the whole idea of, like, you know, what are the strategies that are going to win against these giant guys? You know, and so you got to go, and I was like, hmm. I came back, I was like, that's good, I got it. Thanks. Anyway, I have to head in a little bit, but you guys are, you got, a, you got another question there? Uh, just and the rest of you are awful quiet. Come on, man. <laughs> if you guys are interested in producing ethanol from the corn, if you're looking into that, no, no, no. 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 I'm not doing ethanol. Doing uh, you know, I'm probably gonna do a biogas digester, or uh, you know, I got a bunch of grease from my casino, which is like ten thousand gallons of grease. I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> You know, I mean, what I'm saying is it's like this dysfunctional grease economy. I mean, I don't know what else to call it, right? I might as well run some school buses off of it or something, though. Yeah. Like, in my, you know, if I could do everything, and I'm yeah. working towards that. Yeah. You know, I might, I may, I may, uh, you know, I might run for chief of my nation here, which is a big, big thing. But uh, in the meantime, I'm just trying to do this because I don't have to worry about people's plumbing. I just want to go back. Yeah. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. This is like, if you're head of your tribe and you're really poor, then you got to worry about people's plumbing. And I just really want to work on food and energy. Does that make sense to you? You know, it's like, that's good for me. Yeah? I was told it would be a good answer if I asked you about the nexus of feminism, indigenous struggles, and climate change. Well, that's like a complicated thing. I don't know if I know how to answer that. It's more theoretical than me, you know? I mean, I do what I do because I'm a, you know, I'm a responsible human being. You know, and I think this is what we should be doing. I think that, you know, we have this responsibility to care for each generation and to be the kind of people that our ancestors are proud of. You know, and I don't like being marginalized because I'm a woman. You know, and I know that in the time we're in, a lot of the, the, the things, reasons things are like this are because obviously of white privilege and patriarchy. I'm clear, you know, on that. What's where we got to is a lot of really bad decision making for bad reasons, you know. So do I rankle against that? Yeah. You know, uh, but you know, Condoleezza Rice was no brilliant woman either. I mean, she was brilliant in her own realm, but she was the same, same cloth, different gender, different color. You know, so it's not exactly that simple. You can't replace a, you know, put a woman in a man's paradigm and expect that necessarily things are going to change. So, from my perspective, you know, um, a lot of what I do, you know, reaffirms our relationship to Mother Earth, and you know, we as women are a reflection of that. Um, I, and I recognize that. So, we're good. Thanks. Okay. She's she scratching at the door. Right? Yeah, she <laughs>